Well, there's continued questions over the future of the area around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The Japanese government and the plant's operator plan to start removing molten fuels from its damaged reactors in 2021. But there's been no decision yet on where to store the highly radioactive waste, and local people are concerned. NHK World's Tomoko Kamata reports. In an interview with NHK, the chairman of the Nuclear Regulation Authority says it will take time to decide on where to store damaged nuclear fuels. But he says the site of the Fukushima Daiichi plant is a likely possibility. I think there's no other way but to store them in the current site for a long time under stable conditions. We need to convince people in order to proceed. Shunichi Tanaka also stressed they will help improve the living environment near the plant before evacuation orders are lifted. Part of that is assessing the radiation. Last December and February, the regulators conducted radiation surveys in Tomioka, not far from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. It was the first detailed survey of its kind. Officials measured radiation levels every two meters. Their findings are represented on this map. Yellow spots are areas with high levels, but elsewhere they found the levels were below the government standard. Tanaka says they will conduct a larger-scale survey within a year to provide the data for more locals. With decontamination work, I think we create the right conditions for the residents to return. Some residents say they need to know more about the future risks before returning. Reiko Hachiska evacuated from her home in Okuma town after the accident. She took part in a meeting hosted by the nuclear regulators. We need more explanation to be convinced that we will never be ordered to evacuate again. Tanaka said he is aware of the people's concerns. It will take time for the people to return, even after the evacuation orders are lifted. We will make the utmost effort to support them. Officials faced the challenge of convincing former residents, even as they speed up preparations to lift most of the evacuation orders by March of next year. They say they will carefully explain the situation and try to address residents' concerns. The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has gotten the go-ahead to tackle one of its most pressing issues. Regulators have allowed Tokyo Electric Power Company to proceed with an ice wall to prevent groundwater from entering the site and becoming contaminated. It will be important to carefully monitor the freezing process and continuously gather data. Officials with the Nuclear Regulation Authority gave their approval on Wednesday. TEPCO finished construction of the underground system last month after two years of work. The company is expected to start freezing the wall as early as Thursday. After about 45 days, the daily accumulation of groundwater in and around the reactor buildings is expected to drop from 400 tons to about 50 tons. Implementation of the system was delayed because Regulators feared it could cause the groundwater level to drop too much. That would allow radioactive water inside the buildings to leak out and spread the contamination. So TEPCO decided to freeze the soil downstream first to keep the water from flowing out.
places to store spent nuclear fuel has been a challenge for Japan's government. Officials have had a hard time finding communities willing to host storage facilities. Now, they're introducing what they say is a safer storage method and is increasing the financial incentives. The dry storage system keeps spent fuel cool in metal containers. Government officials say it's safer than the conventional method of storing the waste in pools of water. About 15,000 tons of spent fuel is stored at nuclear plants in Japan, just under 3 percent using the dry cask system. Government officials say spent fuel in dry cask storage weathered the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi disaster better than fuel stored in pools. The government and utilities have been promoting the dry cask system, but many municipalities remain reluctant to accept new facilities. So in April, the government will raise the subsidy for storing a ton of fuel in dry casks to about $53,000. It currently pays municipalities about $3,500 per ton. Japan's nuclear regulators have unveiled a new employee training facility that simulates serious accidents at nuclear power plants. Lack of expertise on the part of nuclear regulators is considered a cause of the 2011 accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. On Wednesday, workers went through practice procedures, assuming a scenario in which an earthquake has caused a serious accident. The Tokyo facility shown to the media is modeled after a central control room at a nuclear plant. The Nuclear Regulation Authority completed it last month at a cost of about $13 million. The simulator is designed to teach workers various procedures, including equipment checks. The aim is to enable the workers to provide utility firms with safety advice on accidents and other emergencies. The facility can expand opportunities for staff to quickly improve their skills. The NRA plans to spend another $13 million to create an improved nuclear plant training facility as part of its efforts to accelerate personal training. Another Japanese utility has decided to scrap an aging nuclear reactor. Shikoku Electric Power Company plans to pull the plug on a reactor in western Japan because it's too expensive to maintain. Shikoku Electric's executive board on Friday finalized the decision to decommission the number one reactor at its Ikata plant in Ehime Prefecture. The reactor has been offline since September 2011. It will reach the 40-year limit of its operational life next year. The government set the limit after the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. The limit can be extended for up to 20 years, but only if the reactor passes costly special inspections. Other utilities have made similar decisions. The Ikata number one reactor will be the sixth in Japan to be decommissioned due to age. Out of 43 reactors nationwide, only two are currently online. Shikoku Electric hopes to restart another reactor at Ikata and will apply for inspections by regulators. Peace activists and academics are calling on Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe not to use a nuclear fuel reprocessing facility that is under construction. They say plutonium produced by the facility in northeastern Japan could be used in nuclear weapons if it falls into the hands of terrorists. The activists say they sent a letter to Abe calling on him to announce the indefinite postponements of the operation of the facility when he attends the nuclear security summit in Washington this week. About 180 people from 20 countries are supporting the initiative. They note that Japan has more than 47 tons, or about 17 percent, of the global stockpile of plutonium reprocessed for civilian use. They say further accumulation is a concern for the international society. At the previous nuclear security summit, Prime Minister Abe and President Obama pledged to work to minimize stocks of separated plutonium. So we want the government to follow through. Experts say nearly 6,000 atomic bombs could be produced with 47 tons of plutonium. 
An additional eight tons a year would be produced after the reprocessing plant goes into full operation. Officers from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department have conducted security drills to prevent possible terror attacks ahead of the Group of Seven summit in May. Reinforcements will be sent to Ise Shima in western Japan to prepare for the arrival of world leaders. Roughly a thousand police took part in the exercises at a training facility in Tokyo. It's part of a program to increase security in the capital, crowded with tourists enjoying the arrival of spring. One scenario involved the spotting of two suspicious drones. Officers used large, powerful drones to capture the unauthorized aircraft in flight. Another drill simulated terrorist attacks at an airport and shopping mall. An emergency response crew worked to overpower terrorists hijacking a bus. One senior official used the attacks in Belgium as an example of what officers need to be fully prepared for while maintaining security in Japan. The Japanese government has unveiled details of how it would deal with a powerful earthquake directly under Tokyo. Officials finalized plans for rescue operations and aid distribution after a massive quake. About 210,000 police officers and firefighters would be deployed from Tokyo and its surrounding prefectures. About 140,000 personnel would be sent from unaffected regions such as the islands of Hokkaido, Kyushu and Shikoku. Rescue operations would begin within 72 hours. The plan says the government will be responsible for securing adequate supplies of relief goods, including food and water, within three days of the quake. The government estimates that about 4.9 million people would be unable to return to their homes. The plan is to ask them to stay in their workplaces for up to 72 hours to help the relief work go smoothly. The government says it will conduct drills under this scenario and ask prefectural authorities around Japan to make plans that tally with Tokyo's. Japan has welcomed record high numbers of foreign visitors in recent years, and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe wants to see more. His government just set an annual target of 40 million tourists in 2020. That's double the current goal. We have the new challenge of preparing for the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics in 2020 and even beyond that. At a meeting of a government panel on tourism, Abe said it's vital to boost GDP to 600 trillion yen or about 5.3 trillion dollars. The government sees foreign visitors to Japan as one of the pillars of that growth strategy. The goal of 20 million foreign visitors by 2020 was nearly reached last year. So Abe has raised the bar far higher for the Olympic year, and he wants 60 million tourists visiting Japan in 2030. Japanese government officials expect foreign tourism to be worth around $70 billion by the time it hosts the Olympics. The government will ease visa requirements for tourists from China, India, Russia, Vietnam, and the Philippines to achieve its new goal. Japan is already a popular tourist destination among people from those countries. The number of people working in Japan's fishing industry has fallen to less than half what it was almost 25 years ago. And nowadays, many of those bringing in the catch come from other countries. NHK World's Yusuke Tamura reports on how they're faring at the port of Yaizu in Shizuoka Prefecture. The Bonito fishing boat, Nikomaru No. 31, pulls in to Yaizu. Much of the crew has arrived from other places in the world. He is from Kiribati. He is from Indonesia. 18 of the 28 crew members are from abroad. Overall, Japan's deep sea bonito ships carry about 650 single road fishermen. Nearly 60% are not Japanese. Most are from Indonesia and the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati. We just finished. Mataba Teriki used to be a farmer in Kiribati. He started working on a Japanese fishing vessel four years ago. Before I come here to work, I know the government decides to share our, our people to other countries.
Kiribati is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, near the equator. Rising sea levels threaten to submerge the land. Some residents are not waiting around to see what happens. The Kiribati government had set up a facility to train fishermen to work overseas. It was built with Japanese support. The Japanese language is part of the curriculum. With his country facing an uncertain future, Mataba opted to prepare for a new career. His shipmate, Andri Dianto, has been working on Japanese fishing ships for 10 years. He sends nearly half of his monthly salary to his family in Indonesia. <laughs> I'm not just working for myself. This is for my children, too. Japan's fisheries industry depends on people like him. Communication is the biggest obstacle. On board, conversation takes place in Japanese. Mataba did not understand that he was being told to carry equipment. A Japanese crew member got the message across with gestures. When I hear a word that I don't understand, I look it up in the dictionary. I also ask Japanese colleagues what it means. We keep a guidebook on board that's written in both Japanese and Indonesian. Cultural differences also present challenges. Most of the Indonesian crew members are Muslims. They cook for themselves in order to uphold their dietary practices. We Muslims don't eat pork. We have fish, eggs or chicken instead. Our meals are cooked separately. On the job, though, everyone pulls together. The crew recently set off for two months of work around Tasmania. We are buddies. Everyone on board is like family. We want to have fun together. And so they cooperate in search of a common goal, making a living by finding fish. Yusuke Tamura, NHK World, Shizuoka.